let's, I'll tell you what, let's open up in prayer real quick and then we'll get started. Dear Lord, please guide us through your word today, Father. Dear God, please forgive us of our sins and please guide us, protect us and watch out over us, Lord. Dear God, please guide my speech, my heart and my mind tonight, Father, as we can go through your word and learn your word. Dear God, please guide me. Let us work in your will, not our own. In your Son, Jesus' holy name, we pray. Amen. So, um, we're going to start out kind of different today. Because I want to touch on one of the main bad guys of the Old and New Testament. But, his testimony is written about in Daniel chapter 4, which is where we'll go here in a minute. But I want to show you, I want to read to you a couple things. If you want to read with me, you can, but if you don't want to have to flip a lot, we'll be mainly studying out of Daniel chapter 4, but I want to read a couple things out of Revelation real quick. Okay? Revelation 17. Just to kind of give you an idea of the guy we're talking about. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, good call. Okay. <coughs> like I said, we're going to hop around just a smidgen before we get to Daniel chapter 4. Um, in Revelation 17... Chapter 1, let's see here. And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the heavens of the earth have made drink with the wine of her fornication. So she carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, or so he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was written the name, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Okay. Now, um, we're going to skip a page here, so to speak, and go to Revelation 18. <clears throat> it says, um, After I saw these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was enlightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and become the inhabitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. I have heard another voice from hang, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye may not be partakers of her sin, and that ye receive not of her plagues. <laughs> For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Okay, now this ain't a study of end times or anything like that. What I wanted to show you is when we read these verses about the end times, we can get a feel about how Babylon was of the Old Testament. Okay? I'm not here to give my opinion on whether or not, you know, the book of Revelations is speaking of a literal city of Babylon being rebuilt or if it's a figurative city that exists today. I'm not even going to go into that. <laughs> okay? What I want us to see is that the Old Testament Babylon is referenced here in the end times because it was such a wretched city. A Jew would know immediately what Revelations was talking about. 
in the Old Testament. Okay? You know, the second you say the name Babylon, they're going to know. Because it was a wretched city. Okay? Yeah, I mean, such a wretched city that's mentioned over and over again in end time prophecy. Okay? Now, as far as the Old Testament Babylon, I want you to see who is the power behind the throne, and then we'll get into something really cool. Okay? This, can, this might get a little versy, <laughs> but I think in the end, I think we'll see what God is steering us towards here. But uh, Proverbs 29, 23... Okay, and we'll get into this, okay? I just want to read Proverbs 29, 23 real quick. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold a humble spirit. You know, I mean, and there's a reason why I threw that one in there. I've got a couple other ones too we can write down later. But let me read one other thing to you here. Isaiah 29, 23. Okay. No, Isaiah 14, sorry. Isaiah 14. Why did I say? Oh, I was looking at the wrong line. Okay. I need to wake up from my nap here. Um, I'm actually going to be reading Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15, but I'm going to start out. Okay? In verse 3, it's a proverb against the king of Babylon. Okay? And it's telling about many things about the king of Babylon. Um, you know, in verse 6, it says, He who smote the people in the wrath with continual... Uh, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and unhindereth. <clears throat> okay? And it goes through many things in verses 3 through 11. You know, all they speak and say unto thee, art thou also become weak as we, art thou become like unto us? Verse 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vowels, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Now, verse 12 through 15 is what I want to touch on, who the power behind the throne was initially in Babylon. Okay, that's where we get to learn a lot. Uh, Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the earth I will ascend above the heights of the clouds I will be like the most high yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit it was pride that caused Lucifer's fall okay that is a great sin we like to point out everybody else's sin but we need to realize pride is a killer. Okay, and that was actually ultimately what was Nebuchadnezzar's problem. Okay, even though he committed all kinds of atrocities, okay, that was ultimately his problem that led to everything. Now we can move on to Daniel chapter 3. Okay. I had it marked with my bookmark my daughter made me. She's always making me bookmarks. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay. Now what this is talking about in Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, Nebuchadnezzar made this giant image of gold. Okay. And Nebuchadnezzar sent together all the princes, the governors, and everybody in verse 2, okay? And everybody, and he was basically talked into 
creating a law that says if nobody bows down before the image when all the trumpets are blown, you know, everything else in verse 5 it says, you know, the flute, the coronet, you know, just all these different instruments, and will not fall, and uh, then in verse 6, and who shall falleth not down in worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning furnace. Therefore, at the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, you know, the flute, the harp, sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people and the nations, the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Okay. Now, in this particular case, there is a question that always arises because Sat. Shat, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we all know the story, did not fall down in front of the fiery furnace and was persecuted by it. And But the, everybody wonders where Daniel was. Okay, Well, Daniel was an administrator, basically, you know, third in command of the country, so to speak. Well, he was probably on administrative duties somewhere. He was like a prime minister. Okay, just in case that question comes up, that's the only viable answer because Daniel went about down. But that's not the point of this. Okay. But anyway, they did not bow down before the king. Okay. And when the king brought them forth, this is in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. That's almost like a... <laughs> that's almost like signing your own death threat right there, you know, instead of being apologetic. They was like, no, we're going to serve our God. Yeah, yeah, our God's the best. Yeah, exactly. This is God's world, you know. Yeah, and then, <laughs> you know, and then Nebuchadnezzar, this is verse 19, okay, well, actually, verse 18, we'll do that. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And this is what I said, pride leads to nearly every sin we've ever committed. You know, that that's my problem a lot and God's really had to break my pride over the last couple of years you know because in verse 19 now if Nebuchadnezzar did not have pride he would have been willing to discuss the situation and find out the facts okay verse 19 then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach Meshach and Abednego therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more, or one, the furnace one seven times more than it w was to be heated. And he commanded the mist, <coughs> the yeah, he commanded the most mighty men that were there in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats and their other garments were cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. Man. Okay. You know, yeah, yeah, bound. And they would not give an inch. Okay. I'm just showing you this because I want you guys to show, I want to show you guys how bad this king was. I mean, this guy was an evil guy. I mean, he was evil to the core, you know. Okay. And therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of the fire slew out those men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's how hot the thing was. The guys that opened the oven door died throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in. Okay. But oftentimes, okay, there's things that come before us or bad things that come before us in order to show us the truth you know <clears throat> to show us because you, know, you got to think this whole time even though Nebuchadnezzar was a king an evil king 
you know, set up, you know, probably, he was into the occult, because he had all these administrators, not only Daniel, but he had a bunch of other ones that were from basically every cult around the known world. He had tons of them, okay? But when we get a problem cast in front of us, like I said, this guy had Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego always speaking truth to him, whether he liked it or not. You know, they was always speaking the truth. And that's what I want to get into. No matter how evil a person is, they can be changed. No matter. I mean, there's nobody too evil to be saved. There's nobody. I mean, because quite frankly, we're all evil <laughs> until we're converted. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto him, King, true, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the burning furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Okay, they went forth. And all the princes, governors, captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, and was the, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Hey. <clears throat> then Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel to deliver the servants that had trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies so it might serve so it might not serve to worship any god except their own god okay therefore I make a decree that every people nation and language would speak anything against the god of Shadrach Meshach and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort, and the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of, province of Babylon. Okay. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 4. <laughs> Daniel chapter 4. But, uh, you know, I mean, here's this horrible king. Now, he still ain't saved at this point. He's just kind of realized there's something to what these guys have been telling me this whole time. He's coming to that realization that I think we've all either either are at or been at that realization, hey, there's something here. There's something here. You know, you throw three guys in a furnace and nothing happens to them and you're sitting there watching and there's a fourth in there. It's going to open your eyes, you know. Like I said, you know, I went through all that stuff earlier to, <coughs> to show you yeah, I heard. In fact, I heard a story the other day. Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> took like four, four or eight of his officers and roasted them over an open fire, not to eat them, but to kill them. You know, yeah, burned them. Yeah, he was a bad dude. But God often puts people in our lives, no matter how bad we are, He'll pair somebody up with us, so to speak. You know, he had Daniel, mainly Daniel, but also Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, always speaking truth, you know, and that's where we get into chapter 4. You'll see a change in Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. You know, same guy that, <laughs> you know, did all these horrible things. His, his country and his kingdom is referenced in Revelation as far as how bad things will be at that time, you know. It's just, that's amazing. The, the image? I believe so. You know? 
I believe so. I believe it was cast down in... Uh, let's see here. Threw me a curveball. I know it's in here. Hang on. Uh, I will find it and get that to you. <laughs> but I believe it was, yeah. You know, but... You know, even after all this, and Nebuchadnezzar had changed having somebody like a Daniel and these three guys in there with him. Nebuchadnezzar still had pride to deal with before he got saved, and we'll we'll get into that here real quick. Okay, chapter four. I wish I would have woke her up earlier. Okay, one through nine. Now listen to this. Nebuchadnezzar, this chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people and nations, languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it was good to show you, or to show signs and wonders that the most high God had wrought towards me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Okay, And I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions in my head troubled me. Therefore I made a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. See? Chapter 4 is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. But what he's telling you about now is him making a mistake again and getting into some cult-like practices, okay? And then came, and this is what I was talking about, he had basically every, I don't know, uh, magician, uh, you know, every type of cult practice headship there with him to go over, th- you know, to answer questions. And in verse 7, Then came magicians and astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, and they did not make known to me the interpretation thereof. But at the last, Daniel came before me, whose name was Belshazzar. Belshazzar. Okay? Now I'll stop right there for a moment. You notice he calls him Daniel, and then he calls him Belshazzar. Okay? Well, history note for you, when when he captured, when Nebuchadnezzar captured that area, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not those guys' Jewish names. That is their, the name Nebuchadnezzar and those people gave them. The Babel, that's their Babylonian names. Okay, Daniel's Hebrew name was Daniel, but his name when they got changed when he got captured was Belshazzar. Now the king himself the ruler of the known world at that time addresses him as Daniel. You see that change there? <clears throat> you know, his, yeah, technically his name was Belshazzar because it got changed, but even the king is seeing something different with these guys, right? <clears throat> According to the name of my God, and whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and before him... I told the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth me, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and interpret them thereof. Okay, he's wanting him to interpret the dream for him, and to go on, he did interpret the dream. Okay, he was able to do that. Okay. And now here's the here's the thing. Give you another little bit of history here. Like I said, it's not part of our normal study, but Nebuchadnezzar put Daniel in charge of this priesthood of cult members that he had there. Okay. Now Daniel would have been instructing them also. Okay. Later on, these people are called magi. What he was over. Now, who who all knows what the, who the Magi is mentioned in the Christmas story? We three kings, you know, that is the Magi. Okay. 
So Daniel, even though he was technically a slave, he winds up getting put in charge of nearly the entire country, winds up over this member of cult, you know, these cultic members, so he can, well, and winds up instructing them, stuff like that. Said God puts people in our lives for a reason. Okay, now uh, 24, verse 24, we'll skip down there. Then, you know, he interprets a dream by saying, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which is upon my Lord King, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be the beast of the fields. They shall come and make thee eat grass as oxen, and they shall, and they shall wet thee with the, more, the dew of heaven. Seven times shall it pass over thee, till, I, till thou know that the Most High ruleth the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy king shall be sure unto thee, and after thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. And in verse 27, he says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, that thou, thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it be, may be the lengthening of thy tranquility. You almost get a hint there that Daniel didn't want to tell him the bad news, but he felt that he had to for the will of God. Okay? You know that, and then basically what what winds up happening here is Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar is turned into a beast, and basically is like a wild ox for seven years. Okay, he loses his kingdom. The most powerful man on the planet loses his kingdom. Why to break his pride? Sometimes we have to have our pride shattered or pride broken in order for God to work in our lives because that was Satan's downfall. And we'll go back into the Proverbs stuff here in a little bit. If we have time. Pride is a killer. That's what caused Nebuchadnezzar's problem. That's what caused, you know, Lucifer to fall from heaven was his pride. All these things bringeth our destruction. But if the most evil king in the Old Testament can be saved, anybody else can. Okay. Um, okay, 30, verse 30. Okay. And here's where you start seeing his conversion. In verse 30, the king spake and said, Is this not, is not this great Babylon, Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the midst of my power, for the honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee eat grass as an ox, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth to those whomever he will. See, it's a pride issue. Once we kill off pride, battle our pride, you know, that's when things can really change in our lives. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails were like birds' claws. Okay, I mean, this guy just overgrown, you know. In the end of the days, now you see the change in Nebuchadnezzar for sure. Watch this. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that liveth forever and ever, whose dominion, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay 
his hand, nor say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason returned to me, and for the whole glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned to me, my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom. An excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven. All those works are truth, and his ways judgment. And all those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Or humble would be another word for abase. Yeah. He is able to humble. He is able to humble any of us. Okay, in any given circumstance. But it's best for us to humble ourselves than for God to do it. Because if God does it, you know, He can do it the easy way or the easy way. It's us that have to choose the easy way or the hard way because everything for Him is easy. <laughs> okay, He's God, you know. But, you know, if the most. Like I said, this guy, this guy was a dictator. He was the king of the known world. Okay? But he was able to give his testimony at the end of chapter 4. You know, God had to humble him first before he realized that God is God. I mean, God is God. But it was his, ultimately, it was his pride that led to all his problems. It was that pride, okay? And pride causes us a lot of problems. But like I said, if Nebuchadnezzar can be saved, brothers, any of us can be saved. You know, there's not one person that can't be saved. You know? That's the, that's the beautiful thing of this. And I want to show you, let me show you something real quick here. we still got a few minutes here. <clears throat> Okay, Proverbs 6, verse 16. And I'll tell you why God had to... This verse right here is why God had to break Nebuchadnezzar's pride. I still battle with pride occasionally. But for the most part, God broke my pride a few years ago. Do I still battle with it on occasion? Yeah. I do. But I'm not the same man I was. Okay? <clears throat> you know, I mean, and in churches today, in the secular world even, people want to rank <laughs> sin. You know, well, my sin's not as bad as this dude over here. You know, this dude over here is not this, this, and this. Or, man, I ain't Adolf Hitler or nothing. You know, so, hey, my sin's not as bad. But what God does in these verses, He boils it down to an issue of your heart. It's not that this dude's committed this thing and this dude didn't. He's done. He, this dude over here, he's just about as sinner as this guy. It's just what he does is socially acceptable. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Proverbs 6, verse 16. These things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that, sow, he that soweth discord among brethren. Okay? You notice all these things follow pride in verse 17. Pride leads to many things. That is a problem I've had for years. You know, you know I grew up, I grew up in a single, well, for the most part, a single parent household off and on, you know, but yeah, probably 90% of the time it was, you know, single parent household and I was the oldest sibling, okay? You know, so I was used to being the man of the house. I fixed everything. You know, I if we was out of food, 
I was out hunting or fishing, you know. I was time fishing. I was catching fish, bringing it home, we'd clean it, fry it, we had dinner, you know. I was used to being the man of the house, taking care of the family. I had a job at the age of four, uh, 13 or 14, 13, 14, 13, something like that, through the JPTA program, okay. I had a job. I was used to taking care of my family, taking care of myself, although all those things I did were good, and although they, they helped out the family, now the problem was my pride was being built up at the same time, okay, because I had a knack for fixing stuff, figuring out how things work, you know, I had a knack for it. Well, that also built up my pride because, you know, I'd, mom would say this broke and I wouldn't even know what it was, but <laughs> I'd be like, okay, what's it supposed to do? And then I'd mess with it till I got it working. You know, I mean, that's just how it was. But, you know, at the same time that was building up my pride, okay, I did not have the realization God was getting us through those bad times, you know, of single mom, two boys trying to feed her, you know, feed, trying to pay bills. It was God who was granting me those good fishing days, okay, because there were some days I didn't catch anything. But seriously, when we didn't have no food, man, I was bringing home a stringer, okay? I was, <laughs> and I was flat tearing it up out there, you know? You know, there's many times that we can get proud ourselves, and that's what leads to our destruction, it is God who granted me those, you know, those times of being able to fix stuff, okay, being able to do stuff. But my problem that become of that was the fact I got used to doing anything without asking for anybody's help. Yeah. yeah, I got to where I can do it myself, like Nebuchadnezzar, me, I, you know, and that ruined me, yeah. God had to break my pride before he could make me useful. Okay? Like I said, I can honestly say I preach my first sermon as an unsaved person. Yeah, I can say that. Yeah, that's the honest to God truth. And I know this is being recorded. The first time I ever preached a sermon was at a church here in town pastor was gone I wasn't even saved I just knew a few Bible verses so they let me get up and do it yeah. Yeah, that's that's the truth yeah. you know I could throw around Bible verses with the best of them and I wasn't even saved and they let me preach a sermon yeah Sunday morning sermon yeah. I was a very prideful person back then Everything was about me. I loved helping people out, but I really enjoyed that it made me look good. You know, it made me look good helping people out. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed people telling me thank you, you know. You know, and I got into that in my 20s for a little while. I enjoyed that, you know, people looking up to me thinking I'm a great guy you know I did I had the same sin that Nebuchadnezzar had and it was pride you know God was able to save him God was able to save me you know but we have to break that pride before God breaks it because when he breaks it it ain't pretty like I said he can do it the easy way or the easy way because he's God and everything's easy for him but for us, it can be the hard way or it can be the easy way. We fight it ourselves or he has to break it for us. You know, when I first started at a company here in town about 14 years ago, I wound up being able to build equipment very fast and very well. All I did was watch the guy next to me and mimic him. That's all I did. And I wound up being in sales at that company. And I got prideful about that. I got prideful. I was in sales. And I was good at it. I was very good at it. But God had to break me. 
had to show me that was his doing, not mine. Because I would watch the guy next to me, and I'd be building equipment when I first started, and I would mimic what he was doing. I learned how to do it from watching a guy that had been doing it for years, you know. And I, he had a table right next to mine, and I'd sit here. My table was about this size, his table was about that size, and I'd mimic him. And I got to where I was faster at it than him. And I was able to shoot up the ladder. Back then, I was like, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. And then I got into sales. I had to build up the whole sales, you know, persona. I had my own persona for sales, you know, because nobody's going to want to buy anything from a hillbilly like me, you know. So I had to figure out how to, you know, how to be the salesman, you know. And that brought, that brought a lot of pride, you know. I'd built this whole persona on this. God was trying to open my eyes because I wasn't making very much money. I made the company a lot of money. I made them, you know, probably a couple million dollars that year. And then I would leave work and hop in my 82 Ford LTD with about a bajillion miles on it. <laughs> you know, God was trying to show me something. It was down the road. He broke my pride. He showed me it's not me. It's him. If he decides to bless me, it's him. If he decides not to bless me, it's him. It's not anything I can do. My job that I have is a blessing from him. He decides when I have it. He decides when I leave. You know? It's really not my decision. That's just how it is. Um, turn just a few pages to Proverbs 16. Verse 5. I mean, you know, we can really think back. I mean, if we really think back, the majority of our problems are based off of pride. You know, I want to do it my way. You know, what's that? Uh, Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way. You know, I mean, that's the anthem for hell right there. You know, I did it my way. It really is, you know. Actually, I preferred the Pistols version of that years ago. The Pistols did a version of yeah, I Did It My Way. Um, I always preferred theirs years ago. But, I mean, that's the anthem for hell right there. I did it my way. It is his way and his doing for everything. Um, 16.5, okay, in Proverbs. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Okay? But mercy and truth, iniquity is purged by the fear of the Lord. Men depart from evil. Verse 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. I mean, there's a lot of great information there. You know, God took a proud king, a proud, evil, hateful king, like in the, most of the verses it talks about his wrath. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the known world. If he said it, it happened. I mean, people were his beck and call. He had everything. And if somebody made him mad, he could have him executed right there on the spot without any question, without any trial. No, nothing would come back on him. He had everything. But God had to break him first. Sometimes God has to break us. You know? Or we can turn to Him. Okay? We can turn to Him and He can work through us and not have to break us. Now there's times that he'll have to break some sin out of our lives once we turn to him. Okay? That he'll have to change certain things about us and sometimes it's not easy. Now Nebuchadnezzar, it wasn't easy. He had to be basically turned into a wild beast of the field for seven years for God to break his pride. I mean, imagine going from the most powerful man on the planet. I mean, come on. Seriously, we're all guys here. I mean... When you was in your teens and your 20s, how many times do you think you was the strongest, most indestructible person on the planet? I mean, honestly, I did. Okay? I thought I was unstoppable. 
especially in my teens, you know. That is, I mean, that's pride, but that's what Nebuchadnezzar had. He thought he was unstoppable, uncontrollable, until God got a hold of him. You know, that's the thing. We have to really, we have to watch ourselves, because, you know, I started dealing with that last night a little bit. Yeah, I started dealing with pride a little bit last night. And I had to, I had to stop myself. And it's not, it wasn't bad towards anybody. It was just me having to reach out for help. Yeah. I had to reach out for help last night. It wasn't anything major. I, I well, I went out and yesterday I went and looked at a car for my mother-in-law. Okay. And making this weird noise. Like I said, as a young man, I worked on everything. I may not have had the proper tools. In fact, my cousin's always yelling at me to stop using a pair of pliers and a hammer on everything. You know, but <laughs> he said there's a proper tool for the job. But, uh, you know, I went out and looked at this car for her, uh, my cousin selling, and he wasn't for sure what the problem was. And he's a mechanic. He goes, I don't think it's anything major. major. I can't pinpoint it, though. I went out there. I crawled all over that stinking car. It runs like a top. There's this one little issue we can't figure out. Now here's the thing. That cousin of mine, okay, great guy, great guy. I believe he's saved. He's always asking me questions about God, the Bible, and everything, but he don't go to church, okay? And I ain't going to go in detail, but he's got some issues, you know? But he's a mechanic. He knows more about cars than I've ever known. This guy is smart. He's like the rain man of cars, okay? But he told me, he goes, I don't know what it is. Now, here's the funny thing. He turned around and looked at me, and I said, well, I'll go home. I'll think about it. I'll dwell on it. I said, I will find this problem. He turned around and looked at me, and he goes, ah, go home. Call Kobe. He'll know. Yeah. Call Kobe. Call Kobe. And Kobe's one of my best friends, you know. But I got home, and I'm like, no, nah, I can figure this thing out. I can do this. I've always figured everything out. That's where it almost caught me. It almost caught me again. It almost caught me. and Because I started thinking, I'm like, no, I'll figure this out. I don't want to bother him, you know. I mean, he's got so much stuff he's doing. He's always working. I don't want to bother him. I will figure this out. And I realized what was happening. I realized that pride was trying to creep back. The me, 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 the I, I, I thing. I can do this. I can do this. Now, I've always been a foot taller than most people. And I've always been stronger than most people twice my size. Not so much anymore because I'll be 40 next month. But, <laughs> you know, but, you know, it started creeping up. And I had to put a stop to it. I'm like, no, 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 no. This, I, I can't, I can't do, you know, I can't let that pride creep up on me. So I picked up the phone. I said, hey, I just, I need help. I just, I said, I don't need anybody to do any work. I just need somebody to point me and say, Darren, go that way, you know. And he goes, well, what's the problem? I told him, then he finished my sentence for me and told me exactly what the problem was. I went out there today, and that was the problem. I haven't repaired it yet, but he told me right where to look. He goes, it's this right here. I'm telling you that right now. I went out there, and that's what it was, you know. But I had to get, you know, I hate talking about, you know, this, you know, but actually, when I put started putting this lesson together on Daniel chapter 4, I didn't think I would come into this equation at all until last night, you know, I did not think I would be in this lesson at all, but the Lord works in mysterious ways, but that, I mean, I, that pride started creeping up a little bit, you know, it did, it started creeping up a little bit, you know, I can, you know, I can do this on my own because, you know, I'm so-and-so and, you know, I can figure this out and I don't want to bother them with it anyway. They don't need bother. They've got their own stuff going on. You know, I finally had to call out like, man, I just need somebody to tell me to go left, right, or straight. I am lost on this. I can't figure it out. The rain man of cars can't figure it out and he was standing beside me, you know, type of thing. I can't figure this out. I'm lost. He, you know, once and I started going into the problem. He finished my sentence, told me exactly what it was, you know. 
But that's oftentimes how pride gets into us. I can battle this addiction on my own. I can battle this sin on my own. I can fight this on my own. Or like me, I can fix this on my own. That's where we have to be very careful, brothers, because I, I battle with that myself. And I'm telling you, it can sneak in unaware really quickly. You know, when my ministry first, after I got saved, my ministry first started rolling, okay? I wasn't even at this church. I'll tell you this and I'll close out. I was biblically smart, I was good. I knew the scripture very well. I debated some cult members. I could prove the churches I was going to at that time. I would beg and plead with the ministers, you're not right. This is the truth. This is the truth. This is the reality. You know, of course, these ministers, they were arrogant, man. They were arrogant. If you met them, you'd know, man, they're full of pride and arrogance. And they wouldn't bend or move on anything. They were very prideful. You know, they used to laugh at me a little bit. But I knew I was right. And that started building some pride. That started building some major pride. Do I still hold that I was right in what I was arguing with them about? With my dying breath, man. Because I can prove it biblically. But how I handled the situation was not right. And that pride started building up in me early on in my ministry. You know, because I was used to these guys. I was used to dealing with these ministers. I kid you not, man. They, you know, they strutted. You know, they had the strut, you know, what we used to call the pimp with the limp strut, you know. You know, and they, you know, they had everything, the new cars. You know, they had all this stuff. You know, they had all the, you know, the fancy degrees and all this other stuff. But they didn't know their Bible. And through, another, through other people's weaknesses, my pride got built up. Yeah, they were arrogant, they were prideful, but at the same time, I wasn't keeping mine in check because I was too busy going on the offensive against them. My pride, yeah, it moved up. And then that first night, I come in here. I come in here, and I met Kobe. I'm like, I honestly have never met a minister that humble before. What's wrong with him? <laughs> That's honestly what I thought. I was like, there's got to be something wrong here. You know, it was initially what I thought. I'm like, you know, this is the place, finally, I found a place that teaches the true word of God, but there's something not right. He don't carry himself like everybody else I've met. Yeah, this guy's cool, and this guy's humble. You know, he's not walking around with his chest sticking out and strutting, you know, and spouting off weird things that don't make no sense, you know. I'm like, this guy's humble, man. I've never met anybody like this, you know. And then I met Matt. Matt was level-headed and cool. And I'm like, I have never, I haven't dealt with this. This blew my mind, you know. Of course, yeah, you get all three of us together. Eventually, we're going to find some minor non-salvation issue we probably disagree with. That's going to happen, okay? You get Billy Graham and John MacArthur together, they're going to find something they don't quite totally agree on, okay? But I found that showed me a lot about how my pride had gotten out. I was like, these guys, these guys got it figured out. I've been wrong about some stuff, you know? I was like, you know, I was like, my gosh, Kobe's the pastor of a church. His whole congregation hangs on his whole word, and he's the most humble person you ever met. I was like, I am messed up. You know, I started realizing, you know, I may be right, but am I right? I may be right in my theology, but how am I right in my application of it? That was the kicker. How was I applying all that stuff I was spouting off? How was I applying that to my life? And it turns out, 
I had let my pride get built up. Just like all those guys I had gone to war against. I was no better than any of them. Because what was killing them was also killing me at the same time. I just had better words to use than them. Okay? I had more correct theology. Okay? And quite frankly, there's a couple of them I mopped the floor with one time because they got lippy with me about it. But the thing about it was, my pride was my killer, which is the same sin that got Satan cast out of heaven. It's the same sin that got Nebuchadnezzar. Same sin that basically leads to everything else. The I did it my way train of thought. That is a killer. That's the theme song for hell right there, I'm telling you. It's either his way or no way. We can either do it his way. You know, the road to heaven. Or we can do it our way, which is the road to hell. Now, honestly... 60% 60% of what I said here, I had not planned to say last week when I started working on this Daniel chapter 4 thing. I just realized yesterday and today how much of me is in this thing. I kid you not, how much of me is in there? How much of the pride that God had to break for me in order to figure this out? But we always have to be on guard about that pride because we're men. Okay? We're men. You know, we're stronger, we're bigger, you know, yeah, I mean, this, that, and the other. I mean, with testosterone pumping through our veins, we feel manly, you know. But that can also be, that can also lead to pride, you know. You know, I used to be prideful about how much I could drink. I could drink, man. I kid you not, I could be, I could drink. Any, nearly anybody under the table. I can just keep plowing forward and still be standing. That'll kill you. You know, I was a machine <laughs> when I set my mind to do anything. I was a machine at it. You know, whatever I set my mind to do, I was going to figure out how to do it and I was going to figure out how to do it better. And God had to break me of that. He had to show me. And even in the little ministry I've had I felt that pride creeping up now and then okay over a cheap car from my mother-in-law I felt Satan trying to get that wedge in there of that pride you know I don't want to bother him I'll figure this thing out you know I'll do it yeah I was dwelling on it for most of the afternoon <laughs> I'm like you know I no no I'm not having this pride thing build up you know, my cousin who don't even go to church, <laughs> the truth, God spoke out of him. I don't need to be prideful about this. Sometimes it's got to be like, man, which way do I turn, left, right, or keep going straight? That's something I've always battled with, is asking for help, asking for prayer. There's sometimes I know I need prayer, I don't like putting my hand up. I'm like, no, I need to pray for this person. I need to pray for that person. I need to pray for that person. I'm so concentrated on that that sometimes I realize my pride's trying to kick up. I'm, yeah, I'm truly concerned about these other people and I truly want to pray for them, but I'm forgetting I need prayer. I'm forgetting that I need help. I need prayer. I need strength that I can't do this on my own. I can't do this underneath my own will. You know, I've battled with these things. You know, and all it does is get worse. You know, and that's why I had to stop myself. You know, yeah, I I really hate talking, you know, about dealing with pride standing in front of a pulpit, but I do that. I battle with pride. And pride is what leads to everything else. You know, if Satan got kicked out of heaven for it, you know, and then 
he's building up Adam and Eve's pride by saying, did God really say that? He was lying, but he was also building them up a little bit. Pride leads to everything. Like I said, I didn't think I'd be teaching or finding myself in Daniel chapter 4 like that, but that's what, it, that's what my realization was, especially after last night. <laughs> you know, my dear sweet cousin, call Kobe. He'll know what the problem is. You know, but we deal with that. We deal with pride, you know. And sometimes pride can creep in under an honest thing like, man, I don't want to bother him. Man, I'll do this myself. I don't want to bother nobody. I'll deal with it on my own. And that's where all of us need to lean together, lean on each other to get through what we're all going through. Because quite frankly... I've been saved for a few years. And if pride can creep up like it did yesterday on me, anything can creep up on us at any time. I mean, just out of nowhere like a freight train, man. It can. It's not that hard. Satan knows our weak points. And quite frankly, some ministers will tell you that you can get Satan in a headlock and you need to punch him in the face. That's not true. Satan is an angel. Look up angels in your Bible. Angels are powerful beings. They're not as powerful as God. But six foot four, two hundred and twenty five pound Darren cannot get an angel in a headlock, okay? I get ripped limb from limb. It's not even a contest. Okay? God. God is where we need to be. Okay, we can't battle this on our own. We need God. But we also need support through each other. That, that, that God can give all of us through each other. You know, because we can't, we can't do this on our own. We can't do it. I can't do it. And believe me, if there's anybody that's been dumb enough to try to keep all the commandments themselves, doing it on their own, I've tried. I tried before my conversion to keep all the laws. Yeah. Yeah, I looked really good to all the people here in town. I looked really good. People were like, man, Darren's really moving up, you know. Nah, man, it was killing me. I couldn't do it. Because I was still breaking all those laws behind closed doors. I was just looking good out in public, you know. I was looking good in public. But we always have to be on the lookout for pride. We cannot beat what each one of us dealing with. I don't know what you guys deal with. I don't need to know what you guys deal with. Okay? Unless you want me to, I don't need to. But I want you to know, I battle with things myself. And pride is a killer. I battle with pride. Yeah, I keep it beat down most of the time. But it creeps its head up in the weirdest of situations. It... it, it yeah, it, it crawls up where, oh, you can do this on your own. You're good enough. You know, you can do this. You can fight on your own. You can fight this thing on your own. That is the part that nails us every time and kills us. You can fight this on your own. No, you can't. Nobody's ever been able to fight anything on their own. Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful king on the planet. He couldn't fight it on his own. God had to level him and then bring him back up again. You know? I'm going to close out in prayer real quick. If any of us needs prayer or anything, let's all get together and pray. Okay? Dear Almighty God, we thank you for bringing us together here, Father. Dear Lord, thank you for opening my eyes to your truth. And please open all our eyes, Father. And dear Lord, please forgive us of our sins. Without you, we are nothing, Father. And Lord, thank you for all your blessings you have given us. And dear Lord, please guide us to you and keep us on that straight and narrow path, Father. For without you, nothing is possible, Lord. Lord, thank you for everything. We pray this in your Son, Jesus' holy name. Amen.